The following interview is being conducted with Dr. Connie Weaver for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It's taking place on May the 30th, 2019 at 1 o'clock p.m. at Purdue University, and it's a continuation from the previous interview, which took place on May 20th. The interviewer is Katie Watson, the France A. Cordova archivist. So, um, Connie, how did you get involved in the research centers and institutes here at Purdue? Uh, so we can start with the first one that I know of, which is the Botanical Research Center. Very good. <laughs> so there was a call for proposals to s submit to the National Institutes of Health, NIH, to study uh, botanicals as they related to health and disease prevention. I had been doing work with soy and various um, plant-based materials that had potentially bioactive compounds that could work against disease. So I considered developing a proposal for this. Um, I had a call out for faculty who might want to contribute to the proposal and uh, suggest projects, I asked them to write a specific aims page and then we would meet and sort through which were the best projects to include in the proposal. Meanwhile, we had to let NIH know if we were intended to submit a proposal and what the general category was so they could plan for proper reviewers. And a, an unusual thing happened in that the program officer contacted me and one other person who was submitting a proposal and said, we don't normally do this, but you may want to talk to each other and consider um, joining forces for a submission. I think you have complementary uh, uh, oh, expertise. Cool. So Steve Barnes was the leader of that effort at University of Alabama, Birmingham. And kind of the rest is history. We started talking and planning together, and it worked out to her expectations that the strongest projects at Purdue could combine with the strongest projects at UAB. And they had a lot of experience in uh, mass spec analysis of bioactives from plant-based foods in we could run animal and clinical studies. So we developed the proposal together, and it became the Purdue UAB Botanical Research Center for Age-Related Diseases. <laughs> and so that's a mouthful. Yeah. But it was such a smart way to proceed, because unknowingly at the time, um, everything in the center had to fit in the scope or the title of the center. So other centers that did very narrow topics, like uh, plants for menopausal symptoms, say, mm -hmm. all the pilot grant programs, all the training, all, all the cores had to work in the scope of that center. So they would receive very few applications for pilot grants from mm -hmm. their campuses, whereas age-related diseases covered cancer and cardiovascular and bo um, bone health and many, many chronic diseases. So it was very uh, easy to get a lot of good proposals for projects. Okay, awesome. Um, so these, so the proposals that you both started with, so the strong um, proposals from Purdue and the strong proposals from Alabama, um, what did you initially start researching? So what were some of the topics of, I guess, these proposals and what, how did you start the center and, yeah. So, so the grant funded four projects and pilot grants, so we awarded several of those every year. It f uh, funded establishing of research cores, so we developed a really strong analytical core for botanical uh, constituents, bioactives. 
Um, also, we developed a really strong uh, method to approach evaluating botanicals that might uh, prevent a uh, menopausal-induced bone loss. Mm -hmm. And so we used the Prime Lab at Purdue where we would give animals or human subjects um, a very rare isotope of calcium-41 to label bones. And then we would follow the tracer output in the urine, which represented retention of bone. And we would um, test various botanical supplements to see if they would delay uh, okay. the loss of bone. And we could do that in 50-day interventions compared to what the usual way to test w was to look at bone density, which bone changes slowly to see changes in imaging techniques like bone density. So the FDA approved protocol for drugs, for example, is a four-year intervention okay. looking at bone density in hundreds to thousands of people, whereas we could had the power to do study like 12 to 16 postmenopausal women in just 50-day periods. And then we could compare because the women could be studied over and over again, studying different doses or different botanicals. So we, some of the things that we found, for example, at the time, there were many dietary supplements in the stores that said, claimed, you could use them instead of estrogen or hormone therapy to prevent bone loss, but they really hadn't been adequately tested. So we published the ones that would work and the ones that wouldn't work. So oh, okay. many dietary, uh, dietary botanical supplements came off the market after we published that they didn't oh, okay. work a at all. But there was much interest, there still is, in botanicals for helping because drugs are expensive and have adverse side effects and people find a diet alternative as le more safe and easier to comply with and le um, they think fewer risks of adverse events. And at that time, or during the time of our first botanical center grant, the Women's Health Initiative results came out where they showed that estrogen therapy was causing some risk for cardiovascular effects. Mm -hmm. And so they really stopped advocating for estrogen everywhere, every professional society. So there was a great search for alternatives. Um, another project the Morays had to, to look at green tea for their bioactives to prevent cancer. And that translated into several um, companies that grew out, up in the Purdue Research Park. Okay. And they still go on today, even though now the Morays have both passed. Um, their companies still okay. go on. And who are the Morays? So Jim and Dorothy Moray were longtime faculty members at Purdue. Jim was the first... Uh, principal investigator of the Purdue Basic Cancer Center. He oh, started okay. that many years ago. And Dorothy Murray was a faculty member in nutrition science, and they worked out as a team looking for um, diet or drugs that would prevent cancer or help cure it. Okay. So, so that. Then the Cancer Center and the Botanical Research Center can work together studying green tea's effect on cancer? Well, cancer so the Cancer Center? Center was probably a loose partner, but um, their project was directly from the Botanical oh, okay. Center and not from the Cancer Center. He had long since stepped down as oh, okay. the director of the Cancer Center. Okay. And then just so I understand this, so um, a lot of the... I guess participant-based research was done here at Correct. Purdue, and then was the um, samples or the data analyzed at Alabama, or what was their I guess what was their part versus Purdue's part? 
so they had projects with the cores and with the uh, projects themselves. So their projects were related more to cardiovascular oh, okay. input. What, what uh, botanicals help reduce hypertension, for example, and kudzu mm -hmm. uh, was the big surprise because it's a weed down south oh, in okay. <laughs> Alabama, and they found one good use of uh, one of the botanicals for helping alleviate hypertension and glucose mm -hmm. management. Uh, so one good use for that uh, weed okay. <laughs> that grew everywhere. But they analyzed the metabolites from the bioactive constituents in the botanicals from all of our studies. Okay. So the animal studies, the human studies, okay. and their own studies in cell culture. Okay, okay. One of the things that we did annually that um, gave a lot of credit to our campus is we had annual symposia mm -hmm. to talk about our discoveries and poster sessions for the trainees to present their work. And we invited uh, people, scientists from other botanical centers, and we invited people from the federal government, from NIH, and from corporate partners. So these were big affairs to showcase our botanical center. So we became quite well known locally and externally. And we would rotate. Every other year was at Purdue, but the opposite year was at one of our collaborating institutions like UAB. But we okay. also had faculty at Rickers and um, University of Illinois on the proposal. But uh, one of the special things we did when it was at Purdue is we contracted a, a dietitian who was a chef to create recipes for the event based on the botanicals we were studying. Oh, so cool. soy and tea and berries and so forth. And so she would work with the Purdue Union chefs to create and scale up the recipes she developed for several hundred people that would come to the symposia. And we would pass out packets of recipe cards that were unique oh, recipes cool. for that. It was just an cool. added yeah. special yeah. event. Oh, that's great. And then how many people were, like, how many other, I guess, faculty or staff were working at the research, the Botanicals Research Center, like, here at Purdue? Like, how big, I guess, how big, it was, how big was it? So probably there were 17 investigators that went in on the proposal, but then you have all of the people who got, were awarded pilot grants, and okay. usually each one had several investigators on that so they would be kind of taken into the fold okay. and be part of the botanical center and then you had all these students and postdocs and lab staff so ultimately hundreds of people were involved wow, okay. in the botanical center and so as so you were director of this center I was right? mm -hmm. so as director what were you specifically responsible for so everything. <laughs> so um, the management of the center. So all the reporting to NIH and assembling the project and uh, core reports annually, uh, coordinating all the conference calls. And so we had monthly calls with the internal steering committee and then periodic calls with the external uh, advisory committee, but we also developed these, uh, and this was pretty early for doing this, these multi-campus seminars and uh, 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 meetings where we would brainstorm like a lab meeting. So part of what we did with the center was get, get um, uh, telecommunication capacities in each one of the universities so we could have regular communications with meetings and planning sessions and then presenting the trainees would present or the investigators would present or we'd share seminars so we had some budget for external seminar speakers but because we were a multi-university consortium mm -hmm. we didn't want to just have it at one campus so we shared with okay. this 
telecommunication cap- capability. Okay, and that was with the four, I guess the four main universities. The four main you, universities, that you correct. That already. Okay, right. great, cool. Um, so did any, other than what you already mentioned, so the report on um, calcium loss and what products work and what don't, what other um, like guidelines or regulations came out of your research or like kind of cool findings? <laughs> <laughs> well, well cool the ca- is the wrong word. Important <laughs> finding, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. So the companies, the startup companies, but uh, and some of the specific research findings, but we started many, many careers. All these young investigators who got pilot grants could then collect preliminary data and go out and get an external grant based on that. So it was a, a seed program to oh, okay. grow a lot of careers. And we had a little bit money to uh, recruit faculty members. So one person that we recruited with resources from the center was Mario Ferruzzi, who came to Purdue. And he also was a mass spectroscopist who could study bioactives. So under the wing of Steve Barnes at UAB, we grew the ability here at Purdue to do that as well. And long after the center to this day, there's been many NIH grants and other very large interdisciplinary projects that come out of this uh, capacity that we build in the Botanical Center, both with analyzing the bioactives, but also with this method for being able to assess effective interventions for preventing bone loss. Okay. And then is the Botanical Research Center still active? So we received the grant twice, uh, the funding twice for this center grant. So we had the grant from 2000 to 2010. We did not, we were not successful in competing for the third round but the infrastructure we built led to another center, this time um, uh, with other co-investigators to study um, grape-derived botanicals like grape juice or wine or that sort of thing for cognitive function effects. So that was a five-year center grant that came out of that. And then a very large interdisciplinary project that I ran that is in its fifth year now, the Berries and Bone Project, where we're looking at blueberries and the ability to prevent oh, bone okay. loss, age-related bone loss. Okay, and so that came out of this great, the study of grapes, which came out of... Well, or, it, or, sorry, not so much, <laughs> yeah, not so much the study on grapes, but the capacity to study berries and bones came out of the botanical center. So all the investigators and capabilities were in place that netted us this $8 million berries and bone grant. Okay, and that's still going on? And that is, yes, still going on. Okay, wow, awesome. Um, So I was gonna move on to the next center, unless there's something else you wanna add. Okay. So the next center, again, that I know about, um, so let me know if I've missed anything, uh, is the Indiana Clinical and Translational Science Institute, um, which was started in 2008. Um, So can you tell me a bit about uh, this institute and how it got started and, yeah? Yes. (laughs) So for many years before that, Um, National Institutes of Health had a program for supporting infrastructure for doing clinical research. And at that time, it was called General Clinical Research Centers, or GCRC. And the idea was, in a medical center, so every investigator didn't have to come up with their own infrastructure, that there would be one centralized that they could tap into. So they didn't have to hire necessarily their own nurse to draw blood, their own biostatistician to help them with the design and data analysis, their own biochemistry laboratories. There would be this centralized effort where any 
investigator could come and tap into that. It, it's a huge advantage to having um, a, a capability like this, not only because it's easier for any individual investigator, but there are um, protocols in place. So if you submit a grant and you say you're running it through this clinical research center, all the reviewers assume that the safety elements medically are in place and that they will be done with standardized protocols. So there's an assurance. At Purdue, we didn't have a general clinical research center. So the kinds of studies we would run, we had our grants we had to prove that we had in place the ability to safely and um, in standard protocols run clinical research. So it was kind of an uphill battle, depending on the study, whether we had the ability to be approved or not. So early on in my research, I started collaborating with people at IU School of Medicine who had this GCRC in place. And my main collaborator there was Monroe Peacock, who we collaborated for decades. I have had many other collaborators, but that allowed me to say our grant is takes advantage of them having this clinical research center. So I didn't have so much trouble myself, but my colleagues who didn't have collaborations with IU School of Medicine and their clinical research center did have trouble. Well, when um, Zerhuni became the director of NIH, he laid out several different initiatives called the Roadmap Initiative. And one of the initiatives he undertook during his leadership was saying, something's wrong with our GCRC process because we have this valley of death between drug discoveries in the bench, in the laboratories, and getting it translated into being able to use these drugs, put them on the market, and let patients have access to them. So instead of having the GCRCs that are all in the medical center, we need to stop that system and have a new system called the Clinical and Translational Sciences Award Program where the medical centers have to partner so that you involve the people and have a continuous pipeline from drug development or initial ideas or devices or intervention all the way to the bedside and beyond into the communities where that is relevant. So it replaced the GCRCs. But it starts with a medical center. So the obvious person to lead it initially was Monroe Peacock, my collaborator who was also the principal investigator of the GCRC. And he said, okay, we need to go in for a CTSA uh, now under this new direction. And that's this infrastructure grant. Oh, okay. So so grants funded the former General Clinical Research Center. Yeah. That was going away, and this new was effort it. was replacing it, and it was still a grant. Now they could be larger grants because they wanted to expand the scope of them to start early in the pipeline and have ways to get the ideas translated into clinical practice or into the communities. And so since the directive was to expand, Monroe Peacock goes, well, my partner at Purdue, Connie Weaver, would be a good complement and a way to expand. Now, so keep in mind, most centers then initially and now, um, their idea of a medical center expanding is to add on a couple of local hospitals. Okay. But this was a very ingenious idea to add in a land-grant university or other universities around the state. So it became the statewide laboratory where we co collaborate. Today it's six campuses, but the initial submission was just Purdue together with IU School of Medicine. And 
Uh, so everything we were trying to cobble together here at Purdue um, became part of this CTS uh, A planning. So that was wonderful because now any grants that we submit, we automatically have this confidence of having being part of a CTS A rather than kind of on our own to try to do clinical research. We we had thought about and tried to get a satellite program with the former GCRCs, but then there were so many restrictions about uh, you had to have billable space like a hospital. So the windows had to be a certain height and all these things. And um, our laboratories didn't meet those codes. The residence halls did. So when we did studies in the residence halls, it could be billable space, basically, but not in our laboratories. So it just never worked. We would have to have had to build a new building. But when they switch from the GCRCs to the CTSAs, those rules went away because now they're broadening the scope so we could automatically partner with them. Initially, the grant, the first submission of the grant failed, which I say was the best thing that happened okay. to our future um, Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute. And the reason I say that is because when Monroe Peacock would try to arrange meetings between faculty at IU School of Medicine and Purdue, mostly who showed up was just Monroe Peacock and me and maybe a few okay. people from <laughs> Purdue because the other faculty at IU School of Medicine had taken for granted so long of having the, the GCRC, they just didn't think they needed to invest a lot of effort. Okay. So because I couldn't, uh, convince anybody to partner us at program levels, uh, Dr. Peacock suggested, well, Purdue, just have your own program in the grant, which we wrote it that way, but the reviewers saw through that and said, uh, you're just silos of two universities, and this isn't integrated, you know, and we didn't succeed. Well, by not succeeding puts at risk all that clinical research at IU School of Medicine because they have to have that infrastructure to accomplish what they need and even be eligible for many grant funding mechanisms. So now they took it seriously. <laughs> now they had meetings they and everybody <laughs> showed up and they integrated Purdue throughout the entire uh, grant proposal so it was much better. And we um, got it in 2008, so our second try. Now the principal investigator um, moved to Anantha Shaker, and he's still the principal investigator in the third round of the five-year uh, grant proposal. He was wonderful to work with. Uh, he's led in a wonderful collaborative Program and we have changed the way research is done in this state as a result of having this grant. So before, it was very difficult to get collaborations going between Purdue and IU School of Medicine or Notre Dame or IU Bloomington. And part of the reason is the institutions were trying to charge each other indirect costs. And so it became so expensive to partner. You might as well just find expertise on your own campus, mm -hmm. even if it's not as perfect, but it's a lot cheaper to do. Well, the CTSI uh, corrected all that. We corrected for collaborative processes in ethics, in uh, core facilities, or how to submit proposals together and how to not charge each other <laughs> like we were completely separate uh, entities. So it just took down all these barriers. And in our second round, we got nearly a perfect score. And in our third round, we got a perfect score, which is almost unheard of at NIH. And it was because they said, you transformed how you do research in Indiana because of the CTSI, and we're okay. going to reward you. So other centers from really stellar medical centers like Duke or somewhere else didn't get funded because they said, 
Dux was good before they had a CTSI. They're going to be good after. We can't really see what difference the CTSI made. Oh, so, okay. you know, eventually they got yeah. refunded. But uh, yeah. that was the thinking. Whereas in Indiana, it was so amazing what all had happened. It was almost unbelievable. Oh. We, we had an external advisory group in for a mock review to help us uh, perfect our proposal with the second round. And they go, why don't you just talk about, about the top 2% of what you're doing because nobody can think this grant could make that much difference of what you've accomplished wow. here in how you uh, do research. So it, it's been really amazing. And again, uh, so one of my specialties in my group specialties are event planning. So we would have annual retreats, and the people who run the food labs in nutrition science would put on the food for all these retreats. And people would come from Indianapolis or Notre Dame or wherever saying, we come for the food and the science <laughs> because it's so good. You know, it was such a good hosting the best way to get thing. I know, <laughs> I know. So that was really um, an enriching time. Again, uh, this grant has uh, pilot grants and uh, the ability to compete for research core dollars and for training students and postdocs. There's many pieces mm -hmm. to it. And so it's stimulating m much research mm -hmm. across the state because you have this infrastructure. So how was NIH assessing the success? Was it based on, like, from the start, so the re researching effects of new medications or anything like that to like the approval, like how many made it or how many made it farther than they were before? So they have review panels and the faculty from Indiana that were on those panels would say just what I told you before, it, it looked like the CTSA award uh, made such a difference in clinical research in Indiana, that's probably the largest single factor. But you quantify like how many papers, how many external grants, what's the return on investment. Okay. And there was a huge investment made internally as well. So we, our operating strategy was that the institutions had to contribute a dollar and a half for every dollar we asked for from NIH. So that's a huge investment. And the investment of the, each institution basically were spent on their own campuses. So what Purdue would sp put together, their share would be about a million and a half a year. And that would fund pilot grants and training and research cores at Purdue campus. But an investigator putting in for a uh, a pilot grant could use any research core from any of the six campuses freely. Okay. And so it, 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 we have 80 some cores that are CTS under the CTSA mm -hmm. umbrella. So our research capacity at a really affordable cost with grant opportunities to use them even uh, just accelerates the whole engine. In this third round that just started, one of the really interesting projects that would have captivated reviewers is the Monon Trail project. So between northern Indianapolis and downtown, close to the medical center, um, downtown Indianapolis is about a seven mile distance, but the average lifespan is 14 years lower in downtown than it is up in the suburb. Oh, wow. So you have the same geographical area. What the proposal is, is to uncover what are the health disparities and the mm -hmm. lack of ability to get health care or prevention or services that are causing that drastic of a difference and then to work with community partners to try to 
implement programs to help close that gap. And ultimately, to your question, ultimately want to show impact in the Mm -hmm. health of Indiana. Indiana is one of the worst states for incidence of obesity and diabetes and smoking and Mm -hmm. uh, infant mortality, on and on and on. So we have a long ways to go. But how to say this infrastructure grant impacts those figures takes a long time. And so mostly so far they're judging what are you putting in place rather than a real impact. But sooner or later we've got to show... Um, how the needle was moved for the health in Indiana. One thing else I want to mention is when IU School of Medicine reached out and had Purdue partner, uh, they were interested in the basic research that we have to offer, drug development and biomedical engineering and the vet school. You know, it really complements the actual patient-oriented research that goes in on at IU School of Medicine, and we study more healthy people anyway, and we train PhDs and they train MDs, so there's lots of reasons we were a good complement. But the surprise to them is we could bring in this amazing community uh, workforce through extension. As the land-grant university, we have extension, so um, because I was head of nutrition and worked with extension, that idea popped into my head right away in the very first effort. And so part of the the commitment of these one and a half to one dollar match that we were trying to do, I could use the infrastructure from um, county educators who are uh, employed by Purdue and have an offset of some of their effort to work with pro- projects with the CTSA. And that looks brilliant. It is brilliant mm-hmm. across. So if you have a project like the Monon Trail, you can engage extension at a grassroots level to reach the thought leaders and whatnot in the counties. And they have an advantage of saying, we're working with IU School of Medicine to give a lot of credibility to what they're trying to do beyond mm-hmm. what they would have without that mm-hmm. credibility. So we have 92 counties in Indiana. Many of them have developed these health coalitions that partner with the CTSA. Okay. And these healthy coalitions led by extension educators will pull together thought leaders in the community and identify what they think in their community is the most challenging health problems and what would they like to accomplish. So they might decide we want to get salads in schools or we want to get more physical activity in schools or we might want to do X, Y, or Z project. So they can also apply for pilot grant funding through the CTS. Oh, okay. and work with investigators at one of the universities or the medical center. Oh, okay. So there's it's a win-win situation. So it's a really holistic way of looking yes. at health and medicine. When I thought medicine, I was like, oh, so they're looking at developing drugs or medications, but this seems to be much, much bigger, more much widespread bigger. than that. So it's looking at all aspects, it really is. all aspects right. of health in yep. Indiana. Okay. That's awesome. And so so this is still going on. So, it is, and hopefully and then, for a long time. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay, so I was going to move on to the next. Yes, subject, good. Or the next project, I guess. So this is, um, so you were also involved with the International Breast Cancer and Nutrition Project. Correct. Um, which started in 2010, I think. I think it's 2019, or 2009, oh, sorry. 2009. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So can you tell me a bit about this project um, and how it got started? Yes. Um, so Sophie Laliev um, is a faculty member in the vet school, and she's a basic medical scientist. That's a, She's a cancer biologist. Her specialty is to... 
uh, build 3D tissue cultures of like breast tissue because she's especially interested in breast. Since then, she started a course. She helps a lot of people develop 3D cell cultures of all kinds of different tissues. But breast is her original primary uh, focus. And she also has developed uh, tissue organs on a chip, so like breast tissue on a chip. So you can screen lots of things that might affect, accelerate, or slow down. Okay development of breast cancer. Well, she was uh, talking to Dorothy Teagarden, a collaborator of hers, who's a basic scientist in art in nutrition science, and they had in mind developing this global sort of partnership. And they came to me because they thought um, my connections and interests what rounded out their more basic interests in cancer. The thought process was that if you looked at the global diversity in diet and how it interacts with the global diversity of genetics and epigenetics in the context of breast cancer development, maybe you could tease out um, what about diet makes you more or less vulnerable to forming breast cancer and what genotypes or epigenetics make you mo more responsive or more resistant to mm -hmm. those diet interventions. Really interested in all of um, exposures could be physical activity or environmental exposures, but we were strong in nutrition at Purdue, so it made sense to focus mostly on diet. Mm -hmm. So I know people in nutrition all over the world. I know a <laughs> lot of people uh, from my traveling and lots of responsibilities. So they came to me to help put together teams. Sophie thought she could reach out to basic cancer biologists from around the world, but she wouldn't know where to start to reach out to clinical people or people with the diet. So so we started putting together teams, and there was no money for this, no grants or anything. So we've just raised it in lots of ways, either... Uh, trying to get money internally from Purdue or from philanthropy or writing grants or all sorts of ways. We've even designed and sold scarves and jewelry and bags to raise money for students to travel from one country to the other and work in others' labs wow. to do cross-disciplinary. So we've been really outside-of-the-box thinkers on this. <laughs> And the original idea was to try to get healthy breast tissue because we're so interested in prevention. It's not so hard, difficult to get diseased breast tissue because you have mastectomies going on mm -hmm. or biopsies and you could get tissue, but it's already gone wrong. <laughs> you know? So... What about getting healthy tissue to, to study what would interact with diet and the epigenetics to prevent it? It's a whole different question, really. Mm -hmm. Indiana started a biobank of collecting healthy tissues and disease tissues. And when they asked women, would you donate healthy tissue? Thousands of women volunteered. Oh. And so they've got thousands of samples in Indiana Bone Bank. It's, uh, I've realized it's a lot more difficult since 2009 to get other countries of the same volunteer mindset mm -hmm. to give uh, healthy breast tissue or to do many things. But uh, So our idea was to look at uh, nutrients in the environment of the breast tissue and the ep and profile the genetics and epigenetics to see how it interacted and have countries 
we, we were only interested in country teams where they had a registry for breast cancer, so we knew the incidence. So we knew which country had really high incidence, which had really low incidence or in between, or how to characterize their incidence. Like some countries, um, the onset of breast cancer is much earlier, and when it's at a younger age, it tends to be much more aggressive and a lot more linked to mortality. So we're interested in these factors. And as we, we wanted multidisciplinary teams, we, the cancer biologists, the nutritionists for sure, but we needed the oncologists to access tissues. We needed um, uh, anthropologists to help us know how to approach women of other cultures. We needed oh, activists. Yeah. We needed the whole variety of teams. So we spent years um, putting together teams. That So we have teams in every continent around oh, wow. the world. Okay. And we have some where there's very aggressive early onset of serious cancers, like in Africa, to Mon Mongolia, where the incidence you know, we thought China was low, but Mongolia is an order of magnitude even lower. And Mongolians mostly consume animal uh, diets, animal-based diets. So they eat high-fat meat and lots of milk. Hmm. And if you look at public health recommendations for preventing <laughs> cancer, it's eat lots of fruits and vegetables and not many animal products. Hmm. So... Clearly, that isn't a one-size-fits-all piece of advice. There's something about their interplay of their diet and physical activity and environment exposures and genetics and whatnot that make their incidence really low. So as we started uh, to work on how can these teams work together and how do we get money to uh, pursue our initial goals, we had to adjust our thinking all the way along of what needed to be done. So, for example, I thought, well, my part, what I could do is ask all the countries to prepare duplicate whole-day diet uh, composites of the diet and beverages their countries ate for the day, you know, a typical um, woman in the age range of onset of breast cancer. What do they eat? What's their national average type of diet? And then if they can... Uh, homogenize that and dry it down and send us aliquots, we can analyze all these things in it that we think might influence cancer. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Then this, that was phase one. And phase two then was to have women consume that diet and collect blood and urine to reflect what might be the bioactives that get into their bloodstream and their urine and whatnot from that diet. So then they would send biological samples. Mm -hmm. So to, the kinds of hurdles we had is how do you get approval in the various countries for doing this? How do you get the samples shipped internationally across customs? How do we get it all analyzed? And we've made... Um, a lot of progress in that, but it's taken years. Some countries we had to start with helping them form an IRB so they could evaluate whether or not they could do this research. So international, or <laughs> no, IRB is uh, Institutional Review Board okay. for evaluating research in human subjects. Oh, they didn't even okay. have that oh, in okay. place. Yeah. So <laughs> we've written ethics grants and other things just to do one little piece. It reminds me, I heard... Um, Someone from Coca-Cola once tell me about their um, desire early on to take McDonald's into China. Mm -hmm. And they said, it wasn't putting a store in China. It was building the roads, building the, <laughs> the you know, FedEx or any sort of transportation for it. It was building the electricity. It was building the phone lines. It was like the entire infrastructure to provide this one store. So it was a huge investment. And then working with all the international regulations and developing international regulations to put in the store. So it was an investment in the future. And that 
was sort of what we had to do. We had to build the infrastructure for how to accomplish all these things. And different countries had different ideas of how to do everything. Like uh, one IRB in one country wanted to be paid to even review. To, we looked at that to think, that's a conflict of interest, yeah. <laughs> you know, to pay you, then you got to approve us practically. Yeah. <laughs> um, so all sorts of hurdles. But now we've got uh, presentations at national meetings of diet uh, constituents from many different countries. We still haven't accomplished in all of our teams to be able to do the phase two human part. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the samples will show up ruined they or they didn't weigh out the samples before they dried them or they didn't get the information to us so we actually have to train them or go do it ourselves in country to oh, get so the information to yes yeah. we might have to go there there's all sorts of things so but the lovely part is these international friendships so I, one of my suggestions to Sophie and Dorothy early on is in order for, to make any progress, we're going to have to get together and communicate on a regular basis, like annually. So let's host international symposia on nutrition and uh, ca breast cancer prevention. So we did, and we've had many of them at Purdue and different ones around the world. And the team would come, and on a separate day from the symposia, they, we had what it was called a think tank, so that we would report on what we accomplished that year, what we needed to accomplish, what barriers were we encountering, so that um, one country who went through a similar difficulty could help train another country's team mm -hmm. for how to do yeah. it. But the friendships of these teams are just one of the most valued aspects of my whole professional yeah. professional personal experiences so you're still in contact with a lot of these people oh um, i have meetings set up at the nutrition meetings coming up in baltimore for ones that are coming in from lebanon or uruguay or oh, different awesome. places yeah oh that's great yeah and then so this is a so it's been 10 years so you're this project is still going on, and you're yes. in phase one, which is just looking at... Well, we're like in phase two, oh, okay. but that's just a little sub-study that related to nutrition to get poised to do the bigger yeah. type of project. And there's many things like that. So Sophie's got a um, uh, cancer biology set of studies going on in various countries too where she's training them to set up 3d cell culture analysis okay. and um, then you have people that are more epidemiology oriented and they're looking at what people are eating in large numbers and relating it to risk factors for okay breast cancer right okay so you're still very much just looking at diet and not in the human trials that's what you mentioned right um so some of the countries have sent us serum and urine oh, okay. after the women have consumed it. Other countries are still working on getting IRB approval. Okay, okay. <laughs> right. Okay, great. Um, so next up. <laughs> yes? Yeah, on the long list is um, the Women's Global Health Institute. Um, so... How was this started, and kind of what was the goal of this institute? Uh, Susan Butler, who was on the board of trustees at one time for Purdue, um, called a meeting with Sophie Loliev and I and said, I don't think there's enough research going on directed at women's health. What's Purdue doing about this? <laughs> well, that conversation led to the idea of developing the Women's Global Health Institute. We looked around at the country and there had been some NIH funded centers previously, but they had sort of evolved into more activist um, advocacy types of groups rather than research. And so we thought there seems to be sort of a gap in this area. And what 
Purdue could offer was to combine um, lifestyle and prevention with the high science and high technology that Purdue's known for. So we could really go after early detection of disease or interventions that would be effective in prevention or um, preventing even of second occurrences. So it, mm-hmm. so we would work with people who had diseases too, but we really could emphasize early diagnostics and prevention because that's what we were good at. And if I was going to lead the effort, <laughs> that was my space, you know, it was prevention. So Susan gave a commitment for a gift of a half a million dollars and that interested Purdue enough to say why don't you co-sponsor between a college and Discovery Park because we were saying if you just go in the College of Health and Human Sciences now then it won't look open to the rest of the campus it'll look like it's for that college and it's true, a lot of the questions related to women's health originate in the College mm-hmm. of Health and Human Sciences. But all the big science and um, technology that we wanted to bring in often wasn't in the College of Health and Human Sciences. So Discovery Park offered an opportunity to reach out broadly in, to life sciences and beyond on the campus. But they don't have the infrastructure of a college. I mean, much of the power at Purdue is very college-oriented. So the college had a development office and staff uh, that could help with such an initiative. In contrast, the Discovery Park really did not. So a partnership, we were the first to partner between Discovery Park and a college in uh, putting together a center or an institute. So that made all of the campus feel open. I, I wish they had given us more funds to work with, but <laughs> we did get the help of the development office and some media and marketing expertise from Discovery Park, and we got um, some help from the dean of Uh, consumer and family sciences that became health and human sciences, Chris Laddish for a half-time administrative assistant or a project manager. And so that is invaluable as a start. Well, we wanted to accomplish several things, and the number one on our list was a pilot grant program because that's where you, uh, you know, for my other... experiences with yeah. other centers that's where you really engage the campus you've got money on the table they can come and start their own questions and if we had pilot grant aimed targeted towards women's health especially prevention will stimulate people to use their expertise towards answering questions in that area and so we had to raise funds we had uh, collated a outstanding internal steering committee and an external advisory committee and the external advisory committee were all either alumni or friends of Mm -hmm. Purdue so they became deeply committed in this initiative and they were from very powerful positions at least at one time in their career if not currently so innovative and wonderful at brainstorming and giving suggestions and they gave a lot of personal gifts towards this okay. that would help us sustain a pilot grant program from its origin through today and some other things that we did then was um, help female entrepreneurs get started so okay. like Jessica Huber who has the speech vibe um, it's been one of Purdue's successes stories where people with Parkinson's disease have a side adverse side problem 
of them not being able to project their voice. Mm -hmm. And so then family and friends don't hear them and they start getting isolated socially. Okay. So she had the idea of developing an earpiece that you put in with white noise in it and you have this automatic reflex to elevate your voice when this white noise is going in your ear. So she spun out, she did testing, uh, got some funds to help make the prototype eventually spun off a company that's now successful um, doing this project. So that's one example. Um, Other examples, UN uh, Yuan uh, used nanotechnology to do drug delivery systems. And she used the pilot data from a pilot grant to get several external NIH grants. Okay. Um, One that's going on now, so it's not completed yet, was to Graham Cooks. During the Zika virus Mm -hmm. scare, he thought he could develop a mass spec technique to look at um, sperm of males to see if they were a carrier. So that to try to help identify people who were at risk of infecting a pregnant or a woman mm-hmm. who might get pregnant and then have a baby born with the terrible defects of yeah. Zika virus. So he he's being funded now. We'll see okay. if that turns into yeah. something. But that's the kind of the projects, mm-hmm. these high technology, high uh, science to mm-hmm. help solve women's, pro- health issues. women's health issues like that. So we created six platforms that had critical mass of expertise at Purdue. Well, I should say four platforms. We've talked about expanding it to a couple of others, but the four platforms that are still in place now are bone health, cancer, women's cancers, um, cognitive function, and wellness. Okay. So we've given pilot grants in all those areas and helped women entrepreneurs that I mentioned to you before. Uh, we do community luncheons, so we go around, we've held them in Lafayette and West Lafayette and Carmel and Indianapolis, where we invite people to hear about what we're doing, have a, host a luncheon, and hopefully get donations then, okay. because a lot of what we do is philanthropy. Mm-hmm. We have a fair amount of estate gifts for oh, okay. long term, yeah. but uh, it's been a challenge to keep enough money coming in for the pilot grants of that year or the next year yeah. and and the administrative assistant, the project manager, Luann Bermel, going. But okay. it's a nice story as well. So the goal, so the Women's Health Institute really serves as, so the goal is to provide pilot grants to people doing research. In well, that's health. one act. Activity, but okay. it, but it's to just accelerate women research in women's yeah. health. So we give travel grants to students mm-hmm. in that topic area, um, and we've had meetings where we uh, brainstorm around our different platform themes to try to build teams mm-hmm. of investigators that would go in for grants and in they this would, area. Okay. okay. So any way we can help. Great. And that's still going on, right? It is. That's still... It is. So now uh, that I've retired, they're searching for a new director. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I saw your picture still on there, so I was was curious. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, And so being involved in all these different um, projects and centers and institutes, um, what has any policy come out of? Uh, the research done in any of these centers? Well, if we could take the str- approach of what in my career has yeah. led to different policies, rather than se- some of them relate to centers and some don't. So okay. let's just we'll take read, a broader, we'll yeah. broader uh, approach to that. So the first federal committee I was on that set policy was... Um, a dietary reference intake committee that put out new recommendations for nutrients related to bone health in 1997. So 
camp calcium data were used to set the uh, calcium requirements for adolescents mm -hmm. for North America at that time, and they still hold true. That experience led to me being selected, among other things, um, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee mm -hmm. in 2005. That is a committee that's funded by legislation. So Congress has in law that every five years all the research will be evaluated from the previous five years. And that sets federal law and policy. So every food dollar spent by the U.S. government has to, by law, follow the dietary guidelines. So mm -hmm. school breakfast, school lunch, and so forth. Um, other kinds of policies that I've been involved with is many position papers coming out of organizations like the National Osteoporosis Foundation or mm -hmm. scientific uh, statements by the American Society for Nutrition. And often I'm invited on the ones that relate to nutrition or my research specifically in whatever the outcome measure or disease that they're interested in. So there are a lot of those. Um, I, I led, I've organized the last two international symposia on nutritional aspects of osteoporosis meetings. And the last one, we put together a writing team in conjunction with that meeting to develop um, guidelines for doing prospective nutrition research okay. related to bone health, and that just got published. Oh, okay. So that's one type of guidelines. Um, let's talk about the Food and Drug Administration Science Board that uh, I've been on for a while. I'm still on. The idea of that is to advise FDA on a, FDA on a range of topics, and some of the recent ones that were pretty interesting are like bioreactor produced meat. So the idea is to take stem cells from fish or chicken or beef mm -hmm. and grow it in cell culture media into massive amounts. So it's it's uh, got the properties of the animal, but it's uh, without any um, animal. <laughs> yeah. You know, so to help feed the world, mm -hmm. uh, that is a potential solution. They've got to conquer some of the technical difficulties and they've got to make it cheaper. But right now there's so much investment capital being put into that that FDA believes in the next five years there will be as many as 6,000 of these companies that oh, are wow. producing it, that they think the obstacles will be conquered. And there's a lot of mixed emotions about that kind of meat, you know, uh, will vegans be able to use that because there's no animal cruelty? There's, uh, well, but you know, made from it's made from those animal stem cells, right? Correct, but it depends on why you're vegan. If yeah. you're vegan because you don't want to support animal mm -hmm. cruelty or you're into sustainability, yeah. that's off the table. So no. is it more? So is this process then more environmentally friendly as well? Absolutely, okay. it could be. You know, yeah. it, it will have to be to be successful. Yeah. Is the idea? Um, they're producing plants already in Europe, but they haven't conquered some of the same okay. issues. So FDA was asking for our expertise on what should we be concerned about. Okay. And so mine was, are they nutritionally equivalent, was uh -huh. what they asked me. But their main concern is you won't be able, they won't be able to detect the difference between traditional agricultural produced animal mm -hmm. food and this bioreactor produced tissue. And so that whichever is cheapest, they'll, they'll adulterate the other one and the, the oh, okay. marketing might be wrong, you know, yeah. because they'll use whatever's cheaper as yeah. a blend. And so that was pretty interesting that that might be their biggest concern. Mm -hmm. So some other things that we've dealt with are e-cigarette risks to health okay. and making laws around that. Um, the opioid addiction was a really big topic. Well, with, with um, FDA Science Board advises FDA, and uh -huh. part of what we deliberate uh, on is public 
comments. Mm -hmm. And so they have an afternoon devoted to public comments on these various issues of interest to the public. And we heard stories on both sides that were just so emotional. Uh -huh. Like someone will say, the only way my child could endure the pain from some sort of horrible accident was with opioids. If you regulate them to the point that someone like my child can't have them, mm -hmm. then the, you're dooming them to such a life of agony, it would be unbearable. Mm -hmm. Then you have the next parent get up, I lost my child to op opioid abuse. Yeah. Get rid of the f easy access to mm -hmm. opioids so they don't abuse them. It was quite uh, revealing and the biggest revelation to me was it's was learning it's only a u.s problem it's because we advertise directly to the consumer yeah. and the way our medical care system is set up is please the patient so you'll have a repeat visit and bring in the business to the clinic and so if that patient only sticks with you because you're going to write the next prescription for their opioids, many doctors are persuaded to do that mm -hmm. because medicine has turned into a business in yeah. art. And that's not true in other countries, so they don't have the epidemic problem we do. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty tragic to learn. Um, I worked really closely with subcommittees subcommitte on how you help deal with food safety outbreaks because that was more in my niche and mm -hmm. the facilities and centers for monitoring those which are terribly underfunded mm -hmm. <laughs> and so how to pr help them prioritize what to do. Um, that led to an event I had this summer wh down in Indianapolis. I was invited by uh, this uh, Indiana University School of Medicine faculty member in communication who hosts this regular program in a local um, pub called Books, Booze, and Brains. Okay. And so she brings, they read a book and she brings in an expert to help with the dialogue and answer questions. And so this book is a 2018 book called The Poison Squad, and it's about the life of Harvey Washington Wiley, who mm -hmm. was a Purdue faculty member, okay. got in tr crosswise with the Board of Trustees because they thought it was completely improper that he was seen around campus riding a newfangled bicycle and <laughs> playing fraternizing with the students playing baseball. He's oh. considered the uh, father of ba baseball club here at oh, okay. Purdue, so he got reprimanded. And he, so he resigned. And they, well, we didn't really mean for you to resign. Just yeah. correct your behaviors, you know. But he went to Washington and started um, evaluating foods for uh, contamination and unsafe additives and preservatives. Okay. There were no laws at the time. So he started this group of men he would give meals or foods to to test if they got sick, he would try to go after oh, okay. the manufacturers. And he was met with a lot of resistance from his bosses and the Congress and the presidents, okay. depending on the era, if they were supportive of him helping the public or if they were worried about um, the commercial loss, okay. you know, and of manufacturers. So some of the same issues of today, only a lot more serious then because uh, some of these additives, they were putting formalin in milk to preserve it. And like hundreds of thousands of babies a year were dying wow. and there was no regulation. But eventually that he was considered the father of FDA wow. because okay. of what he did. So. Oh. Interesting. Well, and so you were invited to talk at this at this event, the event oh. right? Nice. About that book, right? So, throughout your time here at Purdue, it seems like you've been able to kind of spearhead a lot of centers and pro and or just work, I guess, in a lot of um, projects related to women's health. Um, so has. Has the university administration been really supportive of these women's health initiatives? And is there like a particular administration that stood out? Um, 
To some extent. So France Cordova, when she was president, was more interested in health, including women's health, than previous administrations uh, because she started the School of Health and Human Sciences. Oh, she did. And then one of our, because she wanted to make health more visible Mm -hmm. on campus. And we had a bunch of research in undergraduate degrees and so forth in health, but it wasn't really visible on a website or where do you find it. So Mm -hmm. she started the, that was one of her big legacies is starting Health and Human Sciences. And I was a department head during that transition of creating it, and we developed two major um, goals or uh, signature areas at that time, and one of them was women's health because of this of the center. center, Partly, it was Mm -hmm. low hanging fruit. Um, I I don't think that got uh, adopted as well as it could have been by the college. But I was interested in it being a campus-wide activity Mm -hmm. anyway, but we did receive some help from Dean Chris Laddish on on helping support the Luann Bermel's salary and letting us work with the college's development office. Franz Cordova did another thing that really helped my career, and I think then in turn I helped Purdue, is she nominated me to serve on the Showalter Trustee Committee. Okay. So Showalter is an endowment that nets about a million dollars to Purdue and a million dollars to IU School of Medicine per year. And there's three categories of awards, uh, young investigators and... uh, university scholars that are mid-career and then distinguished professors that are more senior. So our committee evaluates these proposals and works with the university to be good shepherds of this endowment okay. fund. And so that that was a nice appointment. Okay, great. Uh, did you want to take a quick break? I'm okay. No? Okay. All right. Um, okay, so you've um, also received uh, one of Purdue's most prestigious awards for teaching. Um, so what, what, I guess what was different about your teaching style? The, the main course I taught for many years was food chemistry at the time that I received this teaching award. And it had a, a laboratory with it, so it was already experiential. But I had the students do, like many masters, research projects, which is a big effort for up to 80 students yeah. in a class. And there typically were about four laboratory sections. So that kind of um, effort bonds you with the students because we were spending a lot of time together at developing their projects and often that would land them the job that they had this extra experience Mm -hmm. that was unique to themselves compared to just an assignment that the whole class did so they actually did many research projects and they were very well prepared to go on to graduate school if they chose to do that oh that's awesome so then I take it you really enjoyed teaching Uh, well I really love working with students and anybody who wants to learn. I, I'm probably not as crazy about the grading part by the 80th <laughs> student, but <laughs> I think that's pretty common. Yeah, I don't I mind the first that. few. <laughs> so I, for, for the really hard work where you do sentence by sentence and train really personally, um, graduate students and postdocs are very rich yeah. experience. When you have the masses, you do the best you can, but uh, one of the last courses I taught was um, nutrition across the life cycle. Mm-hmm. And so I created this project for them to do that was pretty fun, where I took the different life stage stages. So it could be pregnancy and infancy and then adolescence and then elderly. Mm-hmm. And they would be assigned teams in these different life stages. 
and case studies. And so the case study, they had to uh, develop like a video about the problems and give all the advice for what the scenario was. And the creativity that they demonstrated in, so it wasn't just, here's the answer to this question and so boring. They they had to it add, fun. it was really fun. This. And so for those who gave me permission, I was posting it. Oh, cool. You know, from, <laughs> from the department's social media and different yeah. places so that, um, that became sort of a form of extension too yeah. is it could be a learning for anybody who wanted to look at it on the YouTube. Yeah. That's awesome. So do you think, um, with, so you mentioned you had, um, lots of grad students. Do you think you were a mentor to, is there any, I guess, are there any <laughs> students that like stand out? Well, I think I'm a mentor every day, constantly. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all the time, I just adored all my graduate students. Yeah. In the beginning, it was as hard on me when they graduated. I felt like this is how a divorce feels. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not that there was any animosity, but yeah. a separation of a really close. Yeah. But I've learned over years, we find ways to get together oh, at okay. annual so meetings. Like and touch. Yes, oh, almost great. all of them. Almost all of them. Almost wow. all of them. Yeah. That's amazing. Cool. Um, and then, so I guess one of the most recent projects that you worked on, uh, you ran a research camp in 2017 called Camp Dash. Um, so can you tell me a bit about this? Yes. Um, first, let me describe what Dash stands for. It's the Dietary Approaches to Stopping Hypertension. There's been uh, a number of studies, often led by the principal investigator, Larry Apple, um, at Johns Hopkins University who did controlled feeding studies in adults to see what would lower blood pressure. So he learned that this DASH diet, it's called now, which is high in fruits and vegetables and dairy and low in processed meats and sugar and fat, could take half of hypertensive adults off of their medication and correct the control the blood pressure okay. as well as the medications did mm -hmm. um, and lowered uh, everyone on average's blood pressure. And then if he reduced the sodium, could add, be an additive additional reduction in okay. blood pressure. So this diet is adopted around the world now mm -hmm. as a really important um, solution to the biggest lifestyle problem we have is mm -hmm. hypertension underlies cardiovascular disease and cardiometabolic disease of all sorts. So that is kind of like the number one killer mm -hmm. if you can control hypertension. Well, the CDC picked sodium reduction because it's easier to do than the entire change of diet okay. quality, right, yeah. as a, a number one initiative in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Many people, and the dietary guidelines advocate for DASH-like diet and sodium reduction. And American Heart Association and many groups, the World Health Organization, often, largely based on these studies. And they um, wanted to implement it. And lots of companies have adopted trying to low, reduce sodium in their products and whatnot. But when it started to be uh, promoted in the school systems, one judge stopped it and said, until you have data in children, I'm not going to support that you mm. implement these more rigorous diet interventions on our children without data. So the timing was perfect to partner with Larry Apple because I had all this experience in controlled feeding studies with adolescents, and he had the reputation and experience with blood pressure from these adult studies with DASH. So instead of Camp Calcium, now we envisioned a Camp DASH. And so um, studying boys and girls in different races because blacks respond differently to than whites to sodium handling, and consequently they're more at risk for high blood pressure than whites. But we don't know anything about 
Asians or Hispanics. So we wanted to do the four races in boys versus girls. The other thing that had been sort of recently learned was fatty streaks in the heart and blood vessels were being found in children who died, unfortunately, in car, in car wrecks. And risks were starting to be seen in children uh, because they get more overweight and they are starting to develop cardiometabolic sy uh, symptoms. So the new thinking was cardiovascular disease really starts in youth, okay. and we need to prevent it back at that important stage, mm -hmm. not wait till they're in problems in yeah. adults and try to correct it, because lifestyles never work as well in correcting as in prevention, and mm -hmm. we probably have to start earlier than we thought we did. Mm -hmm. So we... Um, worked very hard and got uh, the protocols all in place and got a grant from NIH to do it. But unfortunately, um, that project wasn't completed. So I hope that sometimes, some way that we do learn if diet measures like improving quality of diet and sodium reduction can help prevent um, adult diseases by starting in children. Yeah. Yeah. So you retired pretty recently and Correct. after being here for 40 years, is that Correct. right? Correct. Were you really close with your staff and coworkers here at Purdue? Unbelievably. It was like a family, um, especially the 25 years I was department head. I mean, it was always true in my lab, mm -hmm. but the department really w was bonded in that time. I felt very blessed. And because we supported each other and um, worked well together, we could be great hosts for events or we had the confidence to invite people into our space and mm -hmm. collaborate. So we became pretty well known around campus and beyond, yeah. I would say. And uh, um, yeah, lovely people. <laughs> so it sounds like a really positive working environment. It was, um, very well. A and uh, you were asking me about mentoring earlier. Yeah. Uh, you can tell there's a lot of social events in my life too yeah. <laughs> so I, I hosted a lot of things at my house even oh, besides okay. on campus so the faculty retreats were mm -hmm. at our house and oh, okay. annually I bought a house that would be good for entertaining <laughs> and would have the space for that yeah. and it's um, you hear about difficult faculty meetings in, mm -hmm. around campus but if you're planning for the year together in the department's head's house. <laughs> it's hard to, I think you, it's the mood that's mm -hmm. developed to behave like a faculty yeah. family and so that you work together. It just, okay. it, it sets the tone okay. for that sort of collaboration. And my students, I, I had them over regularly for all kinds of events yeah. and we have an outside swimming pool, but we have a pool table and a, a ping pong table inside the house. So one of our favorite activities is around the world ping pong. So everybody with any uh, skill or not skill of ping pong can uh, participate because it's a big circle with a paddle at each end and you hit it once and put the paddle down and the next person comes along. And oh. so you get three outs. Um, three errors before you're out. So you can at least hit it three times <laughs> before you're out or try to hit it. You get three turns. But the bigger thing I'm probably known for is we had a puppet theater with um, my first grand, our first grandchild, my husband built a, we had a stage in the house wow. and he built a puppet theater. And we started with some starter puppets from Vons, but people would come and see the puppet theater and gift us puppets. So we've got hundreds oh, wow. <laughs> puppets of all different kinds. And so kind of the joke thing, initiation in the lab, is you have to perform a puppet oh, show, amazing. right? <laughs> and 
so at first it may be a little painful for the shy graduate yeah. student, but others would get a minute. And uh, so there were a lot of performances. And when visiting scholars or visiting students would come, and I would often have a, an event at my house, and they would get involved too. So then when I'd go give a seminar at another place where they had been at my house, I was gifted a puppet usually as my speaker yeah. gift. <laughs> you know, And they would talk about the, the puppet sh- theater <laughs> and sometimes it was they would do shows that were parodies on faculty or oh, nice. student life at Purdue <laughs> you know it was really hilarious oh that sounds like a lot of fun yeah so did they give you um when you retired did you have a retirement party so Dennis Saviano hosted one at his house that yeah. was very lovely oh awesome yeah great um so you were a mentor to a lot of people. Did you have, um, is any, does anyone stand out as a mentor to you specifically in your career? Um, yeah, I'm going to mention four people. So my, master, my undergraduate honors thesis advisor and my master's uh, thesis advisor was the same person, Helen Charlie at mm-hmm. Oregon State University. And she taught me how to be a really um, thoughtful scientist and to ask questions constantly, which I tried to really impart with my students, especially in the food chemistry laboratories, that you don't just waste your time in between functions by reading the newspaper or um, visiting mindlessly. You're asking questions about every single thing that you're doing. Why is this constituent going in? What if you added more? What if you added less? What happens if you heat it or you change the pH? You know, you're just constantly querying what you're doing, so you're learning. Don't waste your time. You have a TA up there. You have the instructor. If you're not asking them a question about everything that you can't figure out, you're not taking full advantage of your mm-hmm. um, tuition payment. So that that's what she taught me. Then my PhD mentor, Nathalyn Harris at Florida State. My project came from her colleague and friend who was uh, on faculty in physics at another university. So, and I depended a lot on horticulture or botany faculty, I guess it was. So she helped me get into an interdisciplinary mode that became a hallmark of everything I did after that. But I would say, in terms of learning serious research and grant writing, it was two mentors, collaborators later. One is Monroe Peacock that I already mentioned that we collaborated with and was my partner on Camp Calcium and everything else. Um, He challenged my thinking and writing line by line, (laughs) which uh, was traumatic in the beginning. But to have an MD uh, take that kind of time Mm -hmm. with a manuscript or a grant, I found out was so rare. And he um, was trained in Europe, uh, in Scotland, and then worked for many years in England. So his grammar was fantastic and his wording. And he was a real thinker. So he challenged me all the time. And I evolved to having confidence in working with that kind of environment to appreciating how much time and improvement he made. I'm sure we got a lot more grants because of his careful read and his challenges on what I was proposing to do. Um, The other one was Robert Haney at Creighton University. He was my entree into NIH. So my first grant was as a co-investigator where he was the leader of our project at Creighton. So I went there every year for 10 years while we had that project. And I, um, I proposed most of the studies, and he would critique it ag- again, and then we'd plan the work plan, who did what together. But I learned so much from him. He was a true Renaissance entrepreneur kind of yeah. thinker. So are you still in touch with all of So Robert Haney passed, and I wrote a, 
a piece about him in Journal of Nutrition about oh. his life. And yes, I'm in touch with, um, and Helen Charlie has also passed. Oh, okay. Before, uh, uh, it was real interesting. She grew up in Indiana. Oh, and okay. taught at Oregon State. Yeah. I grew up in Oregon and came to <laughs> Indiana, but she retired back in Indiana oh, okay. on her farm. So we met up a lot earlier in my time here and wrote a uh, text that's still being used today on uh, food chemistry in oh, our okay. oh, in the food wrote... chemistry class. Oh, okay. Together, we oh. have a text. Oh, okay. And it's food chemistry. Food chemistry? Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, I didn't know. That. Yeah. Um, so the two that are alive, I'm still in touch with. Oh. <laughs> right. So are there... Oh. And we, we already talked about that, I'd say. The mentors. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, so are there any um, significant changes that you've noticed at Purdue <laughs> over your past 40 years? Huge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, huge. Well, some not. I mean... The collaborative nature has always been there, and yeah. it's a good place to raise a family, and yeah. you know, an easy place to navigate. Yeah. You know, it's a smallish town, which I'm very comfortable in. Um, but when I came, nobody had a computer on their desk. You remember? Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, and so <laughs> I grew up with computers. Yes, exactly. And copying was on a mimeograph. Oh, <laughs> so the computer is like by far the biggest change that yeah. happened around the world for everybody and even later than a computer was the connectedness so you have yeah. email and mm-hmm. other forms of communication so all of that dra- dramatically changed how work was being done mm-hmm. I, I'm reading a book right now called Follow the Faculty by um, uh, Benjamin Ginsburg. I'm not very far into it, but the concept is uh, too many universities have given up the priority setting and the leadership of the faculty to administration. So we have generated deans and deanlets and deanlings, you know, <laughs> and all sorts of positions where faculty's input is marginalized. Oh, okay. And I would say Purdue is one of those universities, okay. especially recently. The priority is the brand. Mm-hmm and not the original mission of academia. So not the research. Not the research and teaching and oh, okay. uh, service or the faculty. And something was lost yeah. when you do that because you, the book makes the case, one of the things that's lost is it morphs into a life skills Mm-hmm. curriculum, for example, instead of the rigorous curriculum that the faculty with their expertise bring mm-hmm. that's challenging and teaches them more about how to attack life, parents are asking the university, will my child get a job when they're done? And so administration <laughs> minutia evolves to setting the curriculum that then are more life skills or uh, you know more of a job oriented yeah. kind of outcome and research priorities and faculty get lost in all that mm-hmm. I, I would say though the senate in my entire time has never had very much clout here at Purdue Oh, okay. So uh, I think Senates have had more clout in other universities, but I don't think it's ever been all that strong at Purdue. Look at the effort that was mounted the last year or more against um, adopting the online university. Yeah. And if the online university had been adopted where Purdue could... um, take advantage of all that ability to Uh do online courses well and to 
influence the curriculum so it would be the rigorous degrees of Purdue, they would have gone for it, mm -hmm. but they didn't. So that's probably the largest effort that I've seen the Senate take on, and they lost big time, you know. Yeah. So what do you think? I know you have made many <laughs> significant contributions in nutrition and health during your career, um, but what are you most proud of? Setting nutrition requirements in adolescence would be yeah. one. Um, determining dietary strategies that would completely reduce age-related and menopausal-related bone loss mm -hmm. in women. Um, advising the processes for determining how much nutrients, what dietary patterns, what bioactives um, would optimize or promote health. All of that, but the process is as fun as the outcomes, the training, the yeah. connection with people, helping others yeah. do the same things. So when you're young, did you ever picture that you would be, well, I guess have, have achieved so much? Uh, oh, pro <laughs> probably not, but I mentioned in the last interview how at 16 I went to Europe on a people-to-people yeah. -people ambassador tour. So I, I totally imagined uh, traveling and in, engaging in the broader world. Mm -hmm. But being able to influence so much policy and being on such important national and international committees, I didn't know that that would ever happen. Yeah, I think yeah. there's some luck as well as yeah. desire <laughs> but yeah. and hard work too. So um, what do you think that um, for future nutrition and health researchers, um, what do you think the focus needs to be in the future? So our m model for medicine is to treat people who've already got some degenerated tissue or disease. And I think it's a losing battle as the population grows and all the treatments are so expensive and we are very poor at finding cures unless you have a single gene defect or something that here's the cure and you're done which all chronic diseases are much more multifactorial than that we don't have good cures and so you have to start earlier with prevention and that's not consistent with the medical model that the whole training is wait till you're sick and pretty much and come in. Mm -hmm. And the time we have to spend with uh, people is so limited, you can't really get at what you need for prevention. So I, I think nutrition, together with exercise, holds the key for how to be healthier. How do we get that merged with the practical difficulties of the medical model. I mean, we could start early by saying when you check in, you don't just list the medicines you're on, but some little questionnaire to get a hint at your exercise and diet. So it's cataloged and we can start um, pointing to real data that say, oh, men versus women uh, are more vulnerable to this or that, and it relates back to these lifestyle choices, and then that would lead to better education and advice. We could start there simply. Researchers in the field, uh, chronic diseases overcoming our budgets, <laughs> you know, and our quality of life, so I think there's still a long term future with the role of lifestyle choices in all these chronic diseases like obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular, osteoporosis, cancer, on and on. Um, but they're, they tend to be long latency diseases. So it can take decades to have the tissue degrade to the point you have the disease. And all along the way, um, you can impact the course of that. So what we need for research is early biomarkers. Mm -hmm. You know, what can we measure that say you're on this trajectory or that trajectory so that we can more quickly identify uh, correction 
to make each person healthier. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of big data efforts trying to identify those biomarkers now. Yeah. We've got a long way to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're retired now. Um, what are your plans for the future? So I'm uh, in the process of figuring out what the next chapter is, but the next chapter for me is not retire um, the way many people retire. <laughs> <laughs> I would guess that I will have um, more chapters to come. Um, and then is there anything else that you'd like to mention? just um, it's been a lot of fun yeah <laughs> hope it uh, continues to be fun i'm sure it will great okay well thank you so much mm -hmm.